coming up on Harvard Chan this week in health, the power of biology. For students to really understand that understanding biology means understanding their own bodies and decisions they're going to make is very important. In this week's podcast, we'll meet doctoral student Dipali Ravo, a malaria researcher and an advocate for science education. We'll learn about the challenges scientists face in eradicating malaria and why Ravo believes that teaching basic biology at an early age is so critical. Hello and welcome to Harvard Chan This Week in Health. It's Thursday, May 25th, 2017, and I'm Noah Levitt. Amy Montemuro is off this week. And this week, the Harvard Chan School is celebrating commencement, so we're sharing another student profile. Last week, you heard from Pedro Lamoth Molina, an HIV researcher and an aspiring physician scientist. This week, we're sharing an interview with Dipali Ravel, a doctoral student in the Department of Immunology and Infectious Diseases. Dipali studies the biology of the malaria parasite, which affects more than 200 million people each year and kills more than 400,000. In addition to her work in the lab, Dipali is also an advocate for the importance of science education for children and teenagers, particularly basic biology. I spoke to her about the challenges scientists face as they work to eradicate malaria, but also why teaching biology at a young age can help kids lead healthier lives. I started our conversation by asking Dipali what initially drew her to the field of public health. So I came to public health from uh, really a science background, so I'd always been really interested in science from a young age, really excited about the natural world and very curious. And then over the years, I also became very interested in global problems and human inequity in different settings. And so I realized that biology and science could be a really important tool for addressing those inequities. And then over time, I really sort of honed in on this idea of health inequities. And so that was where public health came in. So that's an interesting mix, kind of like having the kind of like lab science part, but also kind of the the inequities part. So I guess where did that where did that interest stem from? So when I was in college, I got to learn um, a lot about biology and biological engineering. And so um, while studying those technical things, I also had the chance to work with some more international focused programs that were thinking about how we use technology to address developing world problems. And so I got to work on a health project in Nicaragua and um, started realizing how powerful biological tools could be for these things. And so I decided I wanted to go to grad school somewhere where I could keep really focusing on biology and biological tools, but then understand the public health context of things and start understanding the delivery systems that are involved in deploying biological interventions. And so you're working in the Department of Immunology and Infectious Diseases. You're working on malaria. Uh, I guess kind of a two-part question. What drew you to want to study malaria and what specifically have you been working on? From a biology perspective, uh, malaria is, I think, a really interesting pathogen. It uh, is a parasite that infects uh, humans but also goes through a mosquito vector. And so it has a really complex life cycle. And uh, there's this constant interplay, sort of we'll call it an arms race, of the parasite evolving and then the host evolving ways to control it. And so I think purely from a scientific standpoint, it's a very interesting problem and felt like an area that could be uh, really powerful setting to learn about uh, human and microbial biology. And then I think more than just that, though, I really knew I wanted to work on something that was a globally relevant pathogen. I was very interested in infectious disease, and malaria has, um, of course, the known sort of mortality toll, but I was also very interested in how infectious disease affects societies at an economic and social level. And so it really tied together a lot of those different things. And I think because I knew I wanted to learn about public health, malaria was something that clearly was going to eventually, to be eradicated, require a combination of biological tools and political tools and economic tools. And so um, all of those things that play into public health, I think this is a good lens for. And so it gave me the chance to explore science, but also um, really deeply explore a lot of other areas that I hadn't been exposed to yet. And so I do want to talk about kind of the biology portion in a minute, but I want to just kind of follow up on something you said there with like, you know, the, the goal of eradicating malaria. And so what are some of the challenges when it comes to eventually reaching that goal of eradication? So there's a few different 
levels, I think, of major challenges. So the ones that we think about the most in our department are really sort of biologically based barriers to eradication. So thinking about um, how effective our current tools are actually going to be over time. So right now, much of the progress in the last several years that's made in controlling and beginning to eliminate malaria uh, has come through new drugs that have been deployed, so the artemisinin-based drugs, as well as um, insecticides in the insecticide-treated bed nets that you hear about. And something we're finding is that in this sort of parasite and intervention arms race that the parasite is, parasites globally are developing resistance to a lot of drugs, mosquitoes are developing insecticide resistance, and so there's this major concern that the current tools that have really allowed us to make a lot of progress in eliminating malaria are start are going to start not being effective anymore. So that's sort of one component of this. And then also malaria is something that is a very complex disease with this complex life cycle that means that if you're going to eliminate it, you have to be able to target hu- parasites in humans, you have to be able to target uh, parasites in the mosquitoes and the mosquito population. And so that requires a lot of resources. It requires really good planning in a health system across all these different levels. And so I think the political capital that you need for that, the educational infrastructure you need for that, the economic resources you need for that uh, are quite a challenge and something that I think many company, countries are making progress on, but uh, still there's a long way to go. And so you talk about the parasite and uh, you mentioned you're you know you're working on finishing up your dissertation. So so what it, what it, what has your research here focused on? Yeah, my research is focused on looking at the blood stage uh, phase of malaria parasite, and our the labs that I've been in have focused on how um, the parasite develops in the blood, and then also how it creates a new stage that gets picked up by mosquitoes and transmits the infection. And so I focused both on that stage that develops in the blood and causes symptoms, as well as that transmission causing stage. And so I've very specifically looked at how the parasite remodels the red blood cell while it's living inside of it. So in order to hide from uh, pressures from things like the spleen in the human, as well as the immune system, parasites have to renovate the surface of the red blood cell and other parts of the red blood cell. And so I focused on a very specific family family of proteins. And so what we see is that if we disrupt the set of proteins, we get major uh, changes in the remodeling of the parasite. And we think that if there's a way to target these proteins, or at least understand their function better, we could start understanding uh, how to eliminate them in a new way that's different than how current drugs or vaccines work. So like in a sense, you kind of trying to, like you're trying to understand how the malaria parasite works and seeing if you can I guess the goal is to change how it works? Yeah, so right now uh, there are a lot of proteins or enzymes in the parasite that current drugs uh, target directly. And um, as we sort of get to the point where we realize some of our current tools aren't working, uh, there's been this sense in the community that we need to step back and just better understand the basic biology and a lot of different pathways of the parasite to basically uncover whether some of these other pathways could be things to target with new drugs. And so my research is really at the very early stage of things. So trying to understand what this family of parasites, uh, family of parasite proteins does, and then perhaps in some way at some point um, they could be targeted with a new class of drugs or interventions. And so hearing you talk, it's interesting because it seems like I'm guessing one of the challenges with malaria is, is you, you kind of talk about this arms race where the, the parasite itself is kind of evolving. But as I mean, as I think as everyone knows, I mean, scientific research takes a long time. I mean, there are no kind of like easy solutions. So, I mean, is, is that kind of a tension that scientists have to deal with that you have to try to make discoveries quickly while the parasite is kind of still evolving in real time? If you look at different drugs that have been deployed, I mean, there haven't even been drugs where in the same year or two years that a drug was finally approved and put into use in communities, uh, resistance to that drug actually started emerging. And so it really is quite a quick time scale. And so I think part of this idea is that if we have new drugs that are starting to hit the clinics right now, we can't stop at that. And we have to still have the basic biology and other areas going uh, so that there's something in the pipeline at all times. And so you mentioned you've had the chance to kind of go into South America, like do, do field work. How, 
H- how did that field work kind of change change at all, like how you view malaria? I had actually never really spent time in a clinical environment and certainly not somewhere where malaria was a problem. It was something that um, from family in India and other places, I did understand the community level toll to some extent. But this, I think, really gave me a very personal uh, hand in things. And so it was when I was actually in Brazil for a field project, um, was in the midst of this general malaria transmission, but also a Zika outbreak that was starting there. And so it was a chance to really much better understand the way a health system can be mobilized and think about the sort of the toll of all of these different vector-borne diseases in that particular area. And in addition to getting to see some of the health system, I also had the chance to work with really fantastic students and um, professors in that hospital department there. And so I actually got to learn a lot from them about the species of malaria that they work on and start to think about the parallels it has to my own work and then had the chance to do some teaching and really take a set of tools that we worked on in our lab and um, make them into something that they could use there. And so I wanted to follow up on the teaching aspect as we were just talking before the interview about biology education kind of in general. So why has that kind of become an important focus for you? In addition to always really loving science, I've also also really loved teaching. It's, um, I think teaching has been a part of my family in a lot of ways and also uh, something that I've really enjoyed and, and found that I'm strong at. And so uh, over the course of just being here at the School of Public Health and learning about health systems in different places and things that are challenges for malaria in particular, uh, I've learned a lot about the need for capacity dif- building in different places and then also just how core education and understanding disease and health is for a person to make informed decisions about their own health and then also to have medical practitioners and public health practitioners and scientists in a community that can really focus very locally on making progress with public health. And so something I've seen is that in many places, there just haven't been the resources or the curriculum focus that allow uh, that type of really rigorous biology education to happen. And so uh, I've been very interested in what the role of scientists and public health practitioners is in actually shaping biology biology education in a very targeted way. So saying, what do we feel people need to understand better to make decisions better. And so I'm starting to look at how I could take sort of my background in biology and now in public health, but also my love for teaching and combine that in a way that can focus uh, on education in international context. But then also I think the same problems of biology education and health decision making are certainly a problem here in the U.S. And so I've also been interested in how I can be involved in things more locally. And so, like, what would be an example, I guess, maybe here in the U.S. of kind of how biology education could have, could kind of affect health decision making? So I think that biology, when it's just taught in a classroom, can also often feel like a very esoteric thing. It's this such a tiny microscopic scale of things going on um, and can seem like a lot of memorization and a lot of facts sometimes. And I think uh, for students to really understand that understanding biology means understanding their own bodies and decisions they're going to make is very important. So I think if you're trying to think about how you make people understand the importance of a lot of preventative measures, so things like uh, cigarette control, for example, um, I think that at least to me and a lot of students that I've had the chance to teach, if you really understand on a very molecular level, the effect of carcinogens on your own cells and understand how cancer can occur, it really starts to make you appreciate the fact that these are real things and that um, making very small lifestyle changes is actually having a real impact. If these pathways are so small and components are so small that you can never see them, then if you don't really understand how they work, I think it can be hard to really make the commitment to make lifestyle changes. So I think from that perspective, it's important. I also think that uh, if we look in the U.S. and in a lot of places, a lot of our health disparities in specific communities, I think, can stem from the fact that there's very few people from those communities that are actually um, empowered to go 
to school or work in a way that lets them come back and work on health issues. And so I think that as soon as you can start to have people from uh, different communities or groups go to med school, for example, or have time in a public health environment like this and then actually go back to their community or be working on a national scale to advocate for the problems in those communities, you can actually start to have a lot of transformative change. That was my interview with the Polly Ravel, a doctoral student here at the Harvard Chan School. If you'd like to see more student stories, you can check out our Why Public Health video series. We'll have a link to that on our website, hsph.me slash thisweekinhealth. That's all for this week's episode. Coming up next week, the anti-vaccine movement in the United States. Minnesota is now in the midst of its worst measles outbreak in decades, after anti-vaccine groups targeted Somali immigrants, leading to a drop in vaccination rates among children. We'll speak to an expert on childhood vaccines about the outbreak in Minnesota, the importance of immunizations for children, and strategies to combat messaging from anti-vaccine groups. In the meantime, you can always listen to this podcast by subscribing on iTunes or Stitcher or listen anytime at soundcloud.com slash Harvard Public Health.